speak of the we and not the I. This is the business of architecture. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for managing and building an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. If you haven't already discovered the four pillars of the smart practice, head on over to smartpracticemethod.com. On that page, you'll be able to download our free on-demand video course all about the four pillars of building a smart practice. That is, again, head on over to smartpracticemethod.com. Kenneth Lewis is a leader in SOM's New York studio office. Ken knows New York's development world like the back of his hand, having managed some of the most complex building projects in the city's recent history. In his 35 plus years in building in New York City and beyond, Ken's work includes One World Trade Center, the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere, and its neighbor, Seven World Trade Center, both built, as you know, under extraordinary circumstances. Ken led SOM's work at 35 Hudson Yards, an undulating residential tower, and home to the first Equinox Hotel. More recently, Ken led construction and development of Manhattan West, a 7 million square foot mixed-use master plan development built above active railroad tracks, encompassing four new towers and reuse of an existing loft building. Today, Ken is leading the most significant renovation and reuse project in New York's history, the complete transformation and ground-up renovation of the landmark Waldorf Astoria. Ken is also the president of AI New York, charged with leading the organization with optimism and pride through this very difficult and challenging time in, for the AEC industry. He also serves on the Urban Green Council Board of Directors, the Center for Architecture Board of Trustees, and the Architectural Review Board of Irvington, New York. In today's episode, you'll hear a conversation covering fees, business development, and leading a team. Ken, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. So great to have you on here today. It's great to be here with you, Enoch. I really love your uh, podcast. Kind of honored. We appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much. It, we'd love to get to know you just a little bit here. Tell us, how did talk about the early part of your career. How did you end up at SOM? If you can just give us some context around your early career and how, how you started there at, at SOM. So I was um, finishing up graduate school, and I had a number of friends that were in New York working for, I would call them the usual suspects, and they said there was so much work in New York that I really should come down, and I would come down on weekends and talk to my friends and sometimes uh, meet with some of these firms. And um, But I was really on a pathway to being an academic. I was teaching a little bit at the GSD and uh, at RISD, where I graduated from. And then came this really cheap airline called People's Express. And I would get a $19 flight, and I would come down on the weekend. And uh, one of my friends, roommate, um, was who was just a really special person, and she's now my spouse. And that's really what drew me to New York. And I came in and I interviewed with everybody. I was very fortunate to get offers from all the different offices. But I came to SOM uh, and I had a lot of expectations because I had been a intern in, in my junior year undergrad or rising junior year undergrad. And it was not a good experience. There, was, uh, there were layoffs. Um, it was a very large, it was, it was one office was almost as big as the whole firm is now. And it was very incredibly hierarchical. I mean, just your, your drawings would be taken from your desk and they would go off and direction would come back. Though the team was very tight and really great people who I still am in touch with. Um, but I just said I'd never go back to S. So when my friends all remind me of that, um, seeing where I've ended up. Um, and it was a very different place. Um, and I came back and I worked on some really good projects uh, right away uh, as a designer. I started off in the design with it as a designer in the office. And when did you make the leap? Because you're no longer a designer at the practice. Yeah. Obviously, that's changed over time. Can you tell me about when you went from a designer to what was the next step for you after designer? Sure. Um, I always had an interest in, say, the business of the project or how decisions were being made, not just in terms of design, but in terms of the economics and what were driving those decisions from our clients. Um, and trying to understand that in a very deep way, and people saw that interest in me. It happened in 96, and we were finished, we had finished up winning the competition. I was in design at that point for Columbus Center, as it was called, 
And I really had sort of hit whatever ceilings. I hate seal the term ceilings because I think it doesn't represent those sort of fuzzy lines. I was ready to move on. I had been in the studio. I really liked what I was doing, but I sort of was at a decision point in my career. Uh, I took some coaching and I looked around for, and met with other people. And then I kind of got a tap on the so shoulder. It wasn't a literal tap. And someone said, I think you'd be good from SOM said to me, I think you'd be good as a project manager. And um, David Childs was the first person who said it to me. And then uh, TJ Gottesdiener, who's a managing partner, consulting partner now. And um, they sort of said, I th we think you'll be good at this. And they brought me along as a project manager on the same project on Columbus Center. And I continue to work on that project today. That's very interesting. In our experience working with architects, the training consulting that we do, and then also internally at our company, we generally find that the design, the design type or the design personality, the design brain a lot of time is all about creativity. It's about the flow. It's about seeing intercorrelated patterns. It's about looking for interesting solutions. And at least on a very surface level, it seems to be very different than a project manager personality, which is very focused on outcomes, deadlines, more scientific. Was that a difficult transition for you? How did you make that transition from what seems to be the left side to the right, right brain to the left brain. It, what was that like for you? I th I'm going to say this, and I'm probably, I could be wrong, but uh, the project manager's role at SOM is focused on the running of the project and the focus, but every one of those people has a background, whether it's in design or the technical, or so to speak, three-legged stool, is, is an architect and is seen as having a voice at the table and again, on these large scale projects, these you know large scale mixed use projects and uh, massive projects, it takes everybody's mind to be on it and to think about those in terms of getting to what we're all seeking, which is design excellence, um, which is over, often overstated, but it is at the core of our work. It's also been um, the culture of SOM is collaboration. Um, we're an AE firm. We're sitting next to engineers, most of whom are trained as architects too. So it's there's no you know, there's none of this right lane, bread and left brain. There are people who who really do um, relish the negotiation of a contract and understanding the terms and how that ultimately leads to a better result for everybody. Um, and maybe that's one of my interests, but it's not sort of what drives me as much as the challenge of the projects uh, at all different okay. levels. What would you say would be your top three roles right now in your position what are the top three responsibilities that you have if you had to put them into buckets um well firm wide firm wide responsibilities uh for uh, marketing and communications as well as uh finance and then project leadership responsibility f with the project managers as a group and then projects that i'm specifically responsible for um, I, does that answer that question? Because I, I might be. It does. Perfect. And that's a lot. That sounds like an intense amount of things to be responsible for, especially with the New York office. It's it's a lot. It can be it can be um, intense. Long days. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, let's talk about fees. This is a popular topic. We're always wondering what's the right fee. How do we set a fee? How do we negotiate with the client? How much, how does that work at, at SOM where you're at right there in terms of setting the fee, both the team members who are involved in setting the fee and then help us as if we were sitting down at a coffee table. Let's say I showed up at a cafe and I said, Ken, I'm really struggling trying to figure out how to set my fee. What advice can you give me? Well, I think the first thing is to understand the facts of the project. What is the schedule duration and expectations? Uh, the form of that, um, is, it a, is it a GMP or what type of contract it will be? Design builds, JV, all the different uh, methodologies. The place, uh, the context is very, very important. Um, the skill sets of the both the contracting side and the leadership side and the typology. So you get all those facts together. What's the size of the project? What's the mix of the building? What's the typology? And then we begin to you call out on three different ways of looking at it, almost on a straight percentage fee, right? Take the construction cost, assume that there's a percentage of that cost that will be equivalent to five, six, whatever percentage it is, and then say that's going to be the total design fee. What do you think the proportion? So that's a really straight exercise. The first thing that goes along with that is establishing, which often doesn't happen, nor are clients necessarily willing to 
to share with you is what's the budget for the project. The second methodology is, I think what most people do, is to look at the project its duration and do a staffing analysis. How many people, during which phase, is it, is it, are there going to be early packages? Is it got a long tail, meaning is it phased? And do a begin and analysis of that. And then the last thing is to look at the, I hate to say this, the commodity prices. That commodity is the worst word in the world that's ever come to architecture and try and build on that information. Uh, and then, you know, look at it. Is it, I'm going to say it's $6, $8 a square foot. And where does that fit into things? And then look at our own data uh, as part of that exercise. What have we, what have the fees been? What is the region? But more importantly is to be in touch with the client and have a conversation. What are their expectations um, in terms of documentation, in terms of, you know, we're looking at the market, we're testing it. What do you think the fee should be? How do you look at it? And, um, and oftentimes, more so than you would ever imagine, people will share that with you. I have an expectation that it's 5% of the construction cost. Maybe I don't know the slice and dice, but that's, that's how we're looking at it. Again, that comes out of clients who are looking at a pro forma, and a lot aren't, not a lot, but several of them aren't ready to share that. But we've talked to enough people that we can know what those pieces are. What changes have you seen over time in terms of the way fees are set, maybe the amount of fees yeah. or perhaps the change in scope of what architects are either required to do or not required to do? How have you seen that shift over time? Well, right now, um, I think I'll talk about right now. We're now uh, taking on the task of the sustainability requirements, um, energy modeling, um, setting goals, whether it's LEED or WELL or, or a state mandated, uh, government mandated um, expectations, plus our own expectations and commitments. And that's a bigger burden. They, the fees are sort of have stayed steady while we've taken on more responsibility. Um, so that's a big, that's a focus. In terms of overall, it is almost job driven. You could go for, I, I just had a conversation where a client said, I do my own punch listing and I'm just, my head almost fell off the top of my head. Why would why wouldn't you want that? And that was to save fee. It was just, just a straight to save fee. And he, and he was coming from the construction side. And of course, we got over that. But the, those types of pressures, the biggest pressure that I see is the commodification of fees and a race to the bottom. Um, I'm deeply troubled by it. We, we speak about it in broad terms at, a, at the large firm roundtable. We talk about what's happening, and we can also look at it from an economics, a big scale economic, which is people f want to keep people employed. They want to keep people, they don't want to lose their their colleagues, and so they will do what they can to make a fee work in that, and that's, you know, that maybe they, there's no profit or very limited profit at, at the very beginning there. Um, I work in the commercial, residential, large-scale mixed use. Uh, government uh, and it's a very real discussion that we're having, uh, beginning to have a conversation, which is those rules that were set, I don't know how many years ago, 30 years ago, that 6% is what the fee portion should be based on construction costs. And it's, it doesn't take into account, and some, and, and frankly, the misinterpretation of that um, meme, for lack of a better word, that just seems to run through everything that everything's included, including your ad services. And no, that's not the case. And so that's one of those struggles uh, that we all have to take a stand on or at least have a, uh, an open discussion with our clients about, um, as well as collectively uh, through, our, through the AIA and other places like that. Mm. And what are the impacts that you're seeing from this pressure, this race to the bottom in terms of the fees? How does that impact your practice? <laughs> Um, it's, 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 um, we try not to be impacted by it, but we are, and we have to, when a client says to us, um, you know what, I think it should be this amount of dollars per square foot and it's 10% or even 20% lower than what our expectations are. We will go back to them and offer scope reductions, uh, shorter schedules that, that, that are advantageous to everybody. However, I have the concern always is the quality of the work and the team that you're working with. And it often takes months 
uh, before you know what that team is on the other side, who is your partner is going to be on the construction side and the and the um, the ownership team and how complex that can be. I, I do know that um, I can be working on one of these large scale projects and maybe I'm talking to six people and someone will be working on a university, a higher education project, and they have, and rightly so, a much larger audience, which is, there's a sort of flip side to that. And they have many more reviews that they have to go through, through stakeholder groups, you know, faculty, uh, leadership, community. Uh, and while those are part of our process, our, the people that we're speaking to is, much, is a much smaller group. And so that's where I think um, many firms are struggling uh, with some of the most complex projects that we that we all do. Mm. What have you found works too? Because what we found is that a lot of times, understandably so, clients are many times focused on the bottom line. They're looking all at the time. looking at saving money. Gotcha. They're looking at everything as an expense. What have you found to be successful in helping reorient their minds to the value proposition that you have and maintaining a high level of fee so you can deliver a high level of quality product? Well, I'll come to the last part. The first thing that pops into my mind is, and it's sort of popping right out, but is to very early on budget. Um, people are often confuse budget with the estimate, and they keep calling, we're going to have an early estimate. That's not an estimate. That is a budgeting and a goal setting, and even early on testing the market and talking to the market together uh, both the architect and the and the contractor, we are absolute advocates for pre-con um, CM representation or contractor GC representation. It, it keeps people real about those things. It's the hardest thing. Uh, I've, I think I heard it on one of your podcasts was when you're doing a house, it's probably the most personal of things that people are doing, but it's also the least educated community as um, clients. They don't have any experience with it. Uh, they actually see us draw and they don't understand that there's so much more that goes into drawing than just that. It's no different at larger scale. Uh, they're always comparing you to the last project. So the so at the front end is to really have a very clear conversation and expectations. On the back end, we are real believers in open, not open book per se, but the idea that at 50%, we do a real estimate. We get out there in the market as soon as possible. We are not afraid of early buys where the ownership is aware that there might be some additional costs as the project goes forward, that it's not the sort of be all and end all. And to have that discussion uh, very, very clear and straightforward. Let's talk to some contractors. Let's test the market. Let's see what's out there and bring, frankly, our, and this is the value proposition. As a large practice, we have a lot of um, market knowledge and um, contractor knowledge and who we believe will deliver the best. And we can sort of steer away from um, people who are going right to the bottom line. Uh, without the, uh, you know, and will not deliver quality. I also would say probably the word that I talk about more than anything else when things are getting a little bit tight is change orders. You know, keeping yep. the change orders down, yep. and a process. I think you talk about that all the time is keeping the change orders, and having the right people in place when that uh, evaluation is going on. What, and then lastly, is have an honest discussion about value engineering and be very clear when the moment is going to happen in the project because it's going to happen. Um, especially in a, an incredibly inflationary market like we're experiencing right now. Oh. Ken, you mentioned you mentioned people having the right people in the right places. And earlier in our conversation before this call, you mentioned that you've gotten some coaching in the past, which is something that sure. I recommend for everyone. How? Let's talk about the coaching a little bit. What have you gained through yeah. through your coaching experiences? Well, I think the most important thing I gained is to know myself better and not to uh, compare myself to my um, pe or people that I admire or people that I don't like, you know, to sort of find my own uh, identity in how I work and to leverage my personality and the things that I enjoy and don't and know what I don't enjoy. Uh, I think the best one that I got from a coach was if someone's yelling at you, it's usually not because you've done something wrong. It's because they didn't tell you something or they didn't um, share something with you. And they're sort of angry at themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, that's not always true. You know, you've made a mistake or there's a 
frankly, an error. They may be really pissed off about it, but at the same time, it's usually because of that. And so sort of looking at them that way, you can engage in them in a conversation and in a calm way and not go on to the defensive. I've learned not to be defensive, but to engage in it. That's probably the most significant thing. The other thing I got from coaching is, and this is coaching in all different levels, is to find your replacement, to find the people that you say could be in your role in a few years and to sort of bring them along and and be a mentor to them. That was um, put yourself aside and think about the future and look ahead and 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 take the time to look ahead. Mm, that's I cool. also had a, I also had one coach, just this amazing guy Jim Peel, who um, was sort of there to help with public speaking and things like that. But it, it turned out not to be about public speaking. It turned out to be what do you believe in? What are your beliefs? And and therefore you became a better public speaker because it comes through you in a much better way. Oh. I hope everyone's really listening to that point because that's so, so powerful and so key. Ken, no doubt about it, in your position, you deal with people a lot and you obviously you wouldn't be given this position of trust, uh, which is a very, very high level of trust that you know, the company has in you and your clients have in you without having demonstrated years and years and years of you know being a trustworthy person and the way you interact with people, the way you lead people, the way you manage people. What are some of the keys that you've developed about working successfully with other people? We know that architecture is a, it's, it's a people industry. You're working with contractors, you're working with clients, you're working with other team members on the team. What would you say would be, what are like, what's, this, what's the secret sauce to motivating I, people, I, keeping I them think, forward? Well, I don't know what the secret sauce oh, is. Oh, Ken, but I thought you were going to. That it's, I'll, yeah, I, I could tell you it's you bring candy to the meeting or whatever, <laughs> something something like that. Um, but I did learn that. Um, have good food. Uh, pe- make sure people are fed. That's an good. old that's an old saw. Um, you know, provide lunch. Don't you know? Don't uh, don't sort of cheap out on those things either. You you'd have my heart um, at that one. Have, that's for sure. Yeah, and uh, I come from my my mother was a caterer. It's my mm. it's my sister's a chef, and so on and so forth. Um, food is the engine, right, of the army yeah. um, line. The other thing I would say is, and I think you've got a little sense of it, is I am one who likes to answer the question that's already coming on your mind. I'm I'm sort of going forward, and I've learned to sit back. I still work on it uh, and listen to everybody who has something. And our secret sauce, if I can say that, is that it really, at our heart of hearts, it's not just a word that we're a collaborative environment. And that means that everybody is, you know, I have an idea, this is what I'm thinking about. And not to be the person who's picking up, this is, as a leader, I think this is really important, not to be the person who's always picking up the pencil and let others pick up the pencil, uh, uh, whatever it is, whether it's figuring out fees, let them work it through and come to you uh, with those their solutions. Um, architects are just a special type. I, I get it. I'm impressed every day to hear about what people's, what drives people and what's um, um, elevating their lives outside the office, you know, and so what can you bring, can you, how do you do that? I do want to say one thing, which I think you start off by saying the company's trusted me. SOM is a true partnership. It's the partners. And it is their trust that you have that, um, uh, and whether you're a principal or a partner or a, a senior principal, it is the trust of others in you that has always been that. It's not some sort of amorphous, it's these individuals that you work with and share. And you may not be working with them every single day because you're all over the world or all over the market, but they are uh, your partner, your true partners in, in what you're doing. What would you say are some of the most difficult or challenging things working with people that you see people generally getting wrong? I've seen it over and over again where people are talking about themselves and it's the, I, I, maybe a cliche, it's, it's speak of the we and not the I. And I'm doing this and I think this is the greatest thing and I, and it might be that that's our culture and it's sort of in Brindy very early, but it is, it is, I do hear that and it doesn't matter whether you're in a large firm or a small firm the I part just that just sort of turns it into a different relationship when you're trying to solve problems instead of here's the problem. Let's work on this together. Let's try and solve this. Even if 
your answer is the best. It's getting everybody to yes and bringing them along in it. And the minute you say, I'm doing this and I think I need to do that and it's my idea, it's just people sort of, they, they just find it, they, 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 their mind changes. They turn it into um, a kind of, it, it creates friction and it's a me versus you when we're discussing an idea instead of this is the problem, let's let's look at that. How how often have you seen that people lack self awareness? In other words, maybe they're sabotaging themselves. You can see that they're doing things like saying I and <laughs> interacting with people and they're just they're just not even aware of it. And um, tell me about that. How do you help All someone become aware? Well the first thing you do is you don't do it in front of a larger group. Um, you take the time to pull somebody aside and say uh, I have some ideas. Would you like to hear them? I think the first thing is to ask permission. Um, and that is a really big, that's the beginning. And then also um, to do it in such a way that as constructive as possible. Um, I think I heard it from a really great critic way back when. There's, you know, there's some negative news I have to give you about your project. <laughs> But the first thing I'm going to do is compliment you. You know, you did a great job. You stood up. You're sharing your ideas. However, you might be getting some pushback. And it's it might be because of X, Y, and Z. And have you ever thought about that? And most of the time, and um, I have a great partner in Jennifer, and she just says, most of the time people aren't, she's a painter, um, and she says most of the time people are completely unaware or have other things that are going on in their lives that are causing um, for. I don't want to call it chaos, but, but fractiousness and sort of trying to see if there's something there. Be, you know, be personal about it. Yeah. I've seen, in my life, I've seen, or generally I've seen two kind of leaders that seem to have success. Some are, they're very, they're very driven, very hard nosed, come across as brusque and cold. They're out for results and they end up burning everything in their path on their way to the top, so to speak. And then there's other, other people and there's everything in between, of course, but then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the caring, the nurturing leader who, you know, isn't a pushover, definitely can make decisions, but at the same time, really just loves people. And I remember my grandfather was one of these guys and I asked him, he was uh, just before he kind of had dementia at the end of his life, and he'd had a very successful career here in California. Uh, he was a lobbyist. He, he became the CEO of a, a very large public agency. Um, and I, I said, Grandpa, what is it that you've done to be, you know, you just had such great success. What did you do? And he just basically looked at me. He said, Enoch, I just, I just love people. I love people. <laughs> and he said, and, uh, you know, if you love people, it's going to go a long ways because people know whether you really love them and have them in their best interest or not. So I'm curious what you've seen in, in in your long tenure in management and leadership. Both I've seen work. Have you seen either one of those approaches work or not? Um, what's your what's your opinion on that? What have you seen? <laughs> I've seen firms go down in flames. Uh, yeah, let's the, yeah, pulling back let's pull just back. for a second to say I had the experience as a young person working with my mother and making money by being working for her as a caterer. And there were, there, I mean, the, the, the separations in society in the 70s, because of the dialogue that was going on, the, the larger social dialogue, I was very much aware of it. And I also had a phenomenal rabbi who was in the civil rights movement and, and spoke about this in, in light of the, of the writings. Uh, whether it was the Torah or the Bible or whatever, it's, it's, you know, that was where he was pulling from. And my mother was like, you need to treat everybody the same way. You cannot, you have to treat people fairly and openly and honestly, because they will never exceed your expectations if you're going to treat them poorly. Now that's okay. my lesson. Um, and it was, it's just carried me all the way through life. Please say hello to everybody. Good morning. You know, no matter who they are, no matter whether you're going into the most difficult of uh, discussions on fee and which are very contentious, but greet them, shake their hand, look them in the eye and treat them as a human being. Um, I've seen it in firms where people are running out the doors to, and, and they've been told coming in that you're going to do the best work you've ever done. Um, it's it's going to be award winning, but you're going to have to work 80 hours at this, and that's okay if it's on the table. But unless but if they're screaming and yelling and berating and putting people down, people are going to run for the door as soon as they can. You know, as soon as they have a move a moment. And I've seen that over and over. 
those, you know, that just does not, it's just not the way I see it. It's not the way our, my firm sees it. Um, and it's sometimes been difficult to have those conversations with, with friends who I who yeah, can yeah. be that way. What I love about that is the, the principle-based approach. You started out with the principle. You talked about very core principles that you learned uh, from the rabbi. And um, it reminds me of Ray Dalio's book, Principles, which is a great yep. book. You, you probably read it or listened to it. And then, of course, Art Gensler's right. book that he said it was very similar. It was just a book, Art's Principles, where he went over his very principle-based. So. That's, that is such a key to success. Speaking of principles, let's jump over to business development. You made a distinction when uh, mm -hmm. we were talking earlier. You talked about sort of pursuing a client versus pursuing a project. How do you approach business development and winning new work? Well, we've, <laughs> we talk about it all the time. Uh, when I'm approaching new work, I'm really part of a team. And um, we have uh, a really wonderful leader in in even and um, that is leading our market and we have a conversation. Let's just say it's a market that we're interested in or a region that we're interested in. And we begin to have a discussion by first thing we do is research. Um, what is the body of work? What are the economics? What's happening down there? Usually it starts off with someone seeing hearing something in the paper that um, Atlanta seems to be jumping. I'm just going to say that. And we begin to go down there and we start to meet with people. Uh, and usually it's people that we know already from other regions. And what are you doing down there? And can we help you with that? Um, and then we begin to engage uh, with local firms. Do we want to team up with you? Are we going to talk about it and talk to our friends about what's happening in that particular region? If there's a client, it really comes down to, hey, do you have a few minutes I'd like to talk to you about the work that we're doing. And my is it's not your father's SOM. It's a different place. And we have some really interesting ideas that we want to share with you. The other way that we speak about this is to engage in whether it's the AIA or ULI or um, any of these organizations that are speaking to trends in, in the marketplace and trends in building. Or, as in the case of education, joining those um, conferences in which there's a lot of leaders that are present in the room. Um, there, and you know what those are. You're well aware of those different things, whether it's higher ed or K through 12 or life sciences. Those are great meetings to see what and hear what's going on, to attend those conferences. Should you attend every meeting of BizNow in the afternoon, though I, I go to them and find them, you know, depending on who's there to be have value, that I don't recommend. It's it's a lot of money and it's a it's probably not the best use of your time. I will give you the recommendation that was given to me by my mentor was go have breakfast with the person you're interested. Just go have a breakfast or a lunch or grab a drink with them and have a conversation. And it's not a sales conversation. It's not a talking about all the amazing things. It's talk to them and ask them, what are you doing? What's going on? How's it feel to you? And it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about you, the person sitting across from you. And they're so receptive to that because they're expecting a sales pitch most of the time. And they, uh, oh, they really enjoy talking about other things and hearing what they have to say and someone listening to them. Ken, where do you think the industry is going? What do you see? What's the trend? Where is architecture headed? What are some of the, maybe I'll narrow this down. What do you think is the biggest threat facing architectural profess professionals in the next decade? Well, I used to believe that the biggest threat was design build, but I don't believe that so much. Um, and I think it's because architects are taking such a leading role in that process. I used to think that was a threat. I think the biggest threat is the race yeah. to the bottom in terms of fees. Um, and uh, the 6% just drives me up the wall. Um, I think the, the worst threat is architects themselves who undersell themselves and do not have a value, pro I don't even want to say a value proposition, don't see the value of their work, or better yet, they don't have the ability to express that to their clients and to the community as, as a whole. And I think that's been shown, um, and I'll say this, engage yourself in the public dialogue, become part of your community board, join, become of the architectural review, you owe people are sitting there and I've, I, I sat on my local architecture board for maybe eight years and they were just 
when I would explain things to them and why they might cost more and why the client might be hesitant to do things that you're suggesting or sort of setting the stage, they were always impressed with the architect's ability to both uh, explain but also to create a picture for people to understand all the different aspects of what's going on. Our ability to think on both sides of our brains, to synthesize, to engage in a conversation, to represent our work is a skill very, very few people have um, outside of our profession. And we all know who they are and who they are. There are partners in design, whether it's landscape or graphics or um, design as uh, in any level, um, there, there are peers rather than others. I think some of the tech people, and I know we all know Red Jobs, is, have, have been greatly influenced by design thinking, Absolutely. what we're trained in. Well, Ken, thank you for being on the show here today. Was, I could probably ask you questions for the rest of the afternoon, but I know you have a, a train to catch, and it's been such a pleasure having you here speaking with us about your knowledge and your experience and moving what we all do here forward. You know, Enoch, I really appreciated the time. I love talking about this anytime, anywhere, um, and these just I'm going to be listening to podcasts on my way Wonderful. off the, on the train today. So thank you for the opportunity to share. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.